at the campground, those are historic period sites. There's a 19th century homestead site back here. There was another one up here by the campground. And we're not gonna talk about non-native uh, use of Big Bone this evening. Uh, we are going to, and we'll be coming back to this map over and over again uh, throughout the talk. Um, you can see the color code. So bright red are where the oldest time period, and, and hold on, I'm gonna go here. I got my slides out of order. All right. There are four major prehistoric time periods. The first, the oldest is called Paleo. And if you see down here at the bottom, at least 14,000 years ago, up to about 10,000 years ago, um, spears, um, all kinds of other kinds of tools. Uh, the next period is archaic. And it, you'll notice paleo and archaic are just other words for ancient. And uh, so that's how we name those as archeologists. Around 3000 years ago, we switched to the woodland time period in the Eastern United States and about 1000 AD, the Mississippian time period. And around here, we call that the Fort Ancient time period. So those are the four major time periods and we're gonna go through each of them here and especially uh, as related to Big Bang. So now we'll go back. All right, so we'll do a real quick look here. So the bright red are where paleo artif period artifacts have been found at Big Bone. So we have five locations in the park where we know um, paleo uh, spear points or artifacts have been found. <clears throat> And then we have early archaic, late archaic, and all the different time periods. And we're going to come back to this slide again each time we start a new time period. We're going to start with the paleo. So we have over here near the springs where my little arrow is going around. And another very interesting area of the park uh, is down here in the southern part. Here's the creek turning south and heading down in a windy way toward the river. And this area right here, and I, I think I have another slide um, showing this, but we'll get to that. There we go. We come back to paleo. Now, look at this as a close up if it makes sense to people. Hopefully it does. This is off the Boone County GIS uh, map. And if you've never been on that website, Boone County GIS, and the Kenton and Campbell is called Link GIS. And you can zoom in and, and look at all the topography and all kinds of features in the county. But here's the creek. Here's the, the closer the topo line, closer these lines are, the steeper the hill. So these are the very steep hills. And you see this interesting little thing right here. And you see this, you follow my arrow. This is an old channel of Big Bone Creek. So the a creek would have at some point come in like that and come around here like that. So the other part of the park with the Paleo Indian artifacts is down here. So we have artifacts over here, we have artifacts. This is the bison pen, by the way. This whole area is the bison pen where you can walk back and look at the bison and over here. So very interesting, very old part of the park. I, I just think it's a very interesting place. I have to show you the three very famous um, Clovis points that were found um, at Big Bone in 1807. Um, these should have been called Big Bone points because um, they were they were not named until they were found in Clovis, New Mexico, in the early 20th century. Uh, but these three were found and then kind of lost for a long time. So the trivia question it's a two part question. Who found these three points in 1807? And if you were here last week, you may know the answer already. And where are these on display now? So they are on display somewhere. Uh, and where is that? And who found them? All right. So let's talk about the first Americans. We're going to do the paleo uh, time period first. And the Clovis culture is the most famous of the paleo time period cultures. And for a very, very long time, everybody thought Clovis was the first ones. And we're gonna talk about why in a few minutes. It is, Clovis is a very interesting culture and time period is because all of their sites that have been dated with radiocarbon dating fall within a, about an 800 year time frame 
from 13,100 to 12,250 years ago. And yet they're found all over the United States, parts of Canada, Alaska, and Mexico. So they spread out across the US in a very short period of time. And we're gonna talk about that here shortly, but I wanna introduce you in general to the Paleo Indians. So the Paleo Indians brought many cultural skills with them to the Americas. And regardless of what time they got here, we know they came from Asia, North Asia, uh, Siberia area, uh, genetics tells us that, linguistics or language studies tell us that, uh, that that's where they came from. Exactly when they got here, that's still a subject of debate. So they brought many skills with them. They brought the domesticated dog. So the dog had been domesticated in maybe more than one place, but certainly in Northern Asia. Uh, and those dogs made the journey uh, with the Paleo Indians. And the dog up here, the pretty little yellow dog up here on the top of the slide is probably similar to what the dogs look like. Uh, that's kind of the generic dog. Uh, and, and that's probably what they look like. Not necessarily what's in this illustration, but more like the little yellow dog. Here's a, a, a petroglyph that has some, uh, clearly what are meant to be dogs um, in, in the picture. They brought cordage, netting, and basketry. They knew how to weave. They knew how to twist rope. Uh, they knew how to braid uh, rope and fibers. Uh, several of these pictures, the ones on the right over here are from Paisley Cave uh, in Oregon and are at least 13,000 years old. Uh, the other one here, this uh, oldest known basketry is from about 10,000 um, to 10,900 years old and it is from uh, Washoe County, Nevada. So, and these are found in dry caves and that's why they're preserved. They brought all kinds of, of, obviously, the knowledge of how to make all kinds of stone tools. Uh, they had a spear thrower, uh, which this is our atlatl, where you use this extra throwing device to make your spear go further. Um, these are examples of Paleo-Indian period tools, uh, scrapers and knives and drills uh, and punches, different kinds of tools. They brought the use of the fire and the fire drill with them. Uh, these are examples of drills up here in the center uh, where that they could use to build and start fires. They brought many different cultural uh, rights, beliefs and practices with them. They brought their whole culture with them. Um, the initial um, travelers, as we can call them. There's a lot on here, but genetic analysis of modern tribes indicates that the source, source of their population is Northeast Asia. Uh, when the first people discovered America is still debated. There are many theories. Some of you may have seen on the news recently um, that there's a site, I believe it's in Mexico, that might push the date on back to 30,000 years. Um, that one is still being debated. Archaeologists have found increasing evidence that people arrived in the Americas well before 13,000 years ago, so before Clovis points. Um, and one of these examples, and I don't have a picture of, this, of it here, is a place called Meadowcroft Rock Shelter that's in southwest Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh. Um, obviously, probably not this year, but um, at some point, they have a wonderful museum that they have built um, next to the rock shelter, and you can go and tour it and see what they found there. Uh, many stratified layers uh, of sites. There's a site in uh, South Carolina called the Topper site. Uh, Topper is very interesting. They had done excavations there for many years, and they had found Clovis points. And when they got to the layer with the Clovis spear points, they stopped digging and said, oh, well, Clovis is the oldest, and we'll get to the politics of that in a minute. Clovis is the oldest, we don't have to dig anymore. And uh, after an, an event I'm gonna tell you about that has to do with Monteverde, people went back to the topper site and started digging again. And below the Clovis layer, they found more artifacts. 
and they found other, a different kind of spear point, and they found charcoal that's older than the Clovis. So there is a layer older than Clovis at the topper site. The most famous of these older sites is a place called Monte Verde in Chile, uh, pictured down here at the bottom uh, left. And I think I have, I'll have a map here shortly that will show you where some of these sites are located. And a man named uh, Dr. Tom Dillahay, who was at the University of Kentucky and um, is uh, at a different university now, he started excavations down there, oh, many decades ago. And he started finding sites. And this area is a boggy, swampy area. So a lot of good preservation. And he's found some sites and he got a series of radiocarbon dates that are over 13,500 years old. Well, this is at the southern part of South America. So if Clovis was first less than 13,000 years ago, how did they get to the bottom of South America before that? And so he started to claim that, well, that there had to have been people here before Clovis. So, and I'm gonna read this to you. Um, his early reports of pre-Clovis occupation at Monteverde sparked widespread skepticism among the archeological community, which largely held, held to the model of Clovis culture in North America as the first manifestation of humanity in the Western hemisphere. Nearly 20 years after excavations at Monteverde began in 1997, a blue ribbon panel of archeologists inspected the site and concluded that Dillahay's analysis and interpretations were correct, accepting an age of at least 14,800 years for the site. This review led to a distinct paradigm shift in the professional community and it was quite dramatic which now favors an early model of perhaps at least 15,000 years or more for the migration from Asia as the means by which the first humans occupied North and South America. And as a side note, uh, Dr. Dillahay paid those guys air travel himself. So he paid for them to go down there so that he could convince them that it was a real site. All right, so let's go to the map. All right, so here we can see way down here on the map on the left, way down here at the little red dot is Monteverde. We have other sites on uh, top where I don't have on this map, but it's over here where my arrow is. We have Meadowcroft, uh, Page Ladson, which is underwater uh, now. Um, a site in um, out here in Texas called the Friedkin site, uh, Santa Isabel down here. Cooper's Ferry, Paisley Caves. They're finding some very interesting stuff in Paisley Cave. Um, if anybody's interested, there's a lot of stuff on the internet right now. Um, I know it's kind of odd, but archaeologists love poop. So this is, if, when it's all dried out in ancient, it's called a coprolite. And they have found these coprolites in Paisley Cave, and they are human and they are probably 14,000 years old. So it's been very interesting uh, research that's been going on over here uh, in the state of Washington and Oregon uh, in this whole Northwest coast area. So that is that map. And then if we look at the map on the right, we can see where Clovis points are found. And I've got another map with Clovis um, points here all across the United States. Uh, and into Mexico, and um, I believe up in Alaska that we'll see here shortly. So if people were in Monteverde before Clovis points were invented, wherever they were invented, uh, and if they were at Meadowcroft or Page Lanson or Cooper's Ferry or any of these other sites um, older than any Clovis point, the, there's two questions then that become our options. First, Clovis points were invented in, the, in North America by someone who was already here, or there was a second migration of people who brought Clovis points with them. So th those are kind of our two uh, choices that we end up with for Clovis. And here, uh, I got a great, a great cartoon I have to share. 
somebody put this on an uh, archaeology Facebook um, some months ago. And here you see the people running um, down through Western North America. They're killing bison and mastodons on the way with their spears. And the, the, the people that are already here say, well, those Clovis people always have to be first. Who are these guys? And another group says, make more Clovis points. So we're back to our choices then. How did Clovis points spread all across the United States in 800 years? We haven't solved the answer to that yet, but it, it's fascinating. And here's a great map. A group of researchers went and um, they looked across the whole United States and up into Canada and they went county by county and they counted up how many Clovis points have been documented in each county and all these dots, that's why they're in little grids, all these dots are by county. So we have all these dots. So where's the biggest concentration of Clovis points? They're in the Eastern United States. On the other hand, where's the oldest Clovis point? They're in Texas. So I mentioned that Friedkin site and there's uh, some other sites in Texas. So the oldest Clovis points are in here. So all very, very interesting. But we're gonna have to move on to our next time period. Um, here are some of the sites. We don't have time to talk about all these different, these are the dates. You can see how tight the dates are um, to each other. And my arrow points to the oldest. Number 18 is Lubbock Lake in Texas, and it has the oldest uh, close dates. And also up here, uh, number five, and also number 10. So these three are the oldest of the dates. All right, let's move on to the next time period. So the paleo people, Clovis, whoever they are, they've spread out across the United States. They're starting to settle down into different regions and to, along different rivers and streams. Uh, Technology is starting to change. Um, the large mammals are gone, whether the uh, natives uh, killed them or climate change or a combination, which is probably the best case. It's a combination of uh, climate change with uh, US area warming up because of the end of the glaciers have retreated and it's turning into more climate near, kind of like what we have now. Um, and also the native tribes were uh, killing them uh, to a large degree. And so we have the end of that. So the large spear points that are, you know, this long, um, five, six inches long, it's over, you're not gonna kill a deer with that, it's too big. So they switched to making a lot of smaller points. So we have the next time period, which is archaic. It's divided into early, middle, and late. Uh, we really don't have a lot of middle archaic around here. Uh, a lot of people think we had some uh, climate issues and most of them went down to the Green River in Kentucky, uh, which is where there's a lot of middle archaic. So early archaic is the kind of orangey brown and the yellowish color is late archaic. So you can see we have early and late archaic over here. We have early and late archaic over here. We have it pretty much throughout the park uh, is the archaic time period. And it, it's a long time period, like 8,000 years. Um, and it, it is spread throughout the park. So what makes the archaic different? We start obviously seeing an increase in population. People are settling down uh, into uh, stream and river valleys in the nearby hillsides. Uh, they are nomadic still, hunters and gatherers, uh, many small sites, uh, a few intensive sites focused on the river valleys and places where they can access multiple resource locations. So if you're living in a valley, you can go up into the hills, you can go down by the river, um, you can go to the, the swamp, you can get the uh, nuts in the fall and the berries in the summer, et cetera, migrating birds you know, in the spring and fall. So they liked upper terraces. So in the trends, we get re increasing regionalization. Uh, people aren't necessarily crossing the United States anymore. Uh, they're moving to complex hunters and gatherers. So they're starting to maybe uh, burn down a, a wood so that they can grow more berries, will grow on the edge of the woods, for example. Uh, changes in projectile point technology. 
Uh, and the, the changes in projectile points mark the time differences. And these, all of these are examples of early archaic spear points. The variety just is vastly increased. Middle Archaic, we don't have a lot of that around here, but it's a time period, uh, and these tools do show up around here. Um, groundstone tools, uh, these are called pestles up here at the top. Uh, axes and adzes show up in this time period. Um, heavy reliance on nut resources through this time period. By the Late Archaic, which is about 3000 BC, so 5,000 years ago, starts the um, late archaic around here in the Ohio Valley. And I mean, many places else in the US were just focused on right here in, in at Big Ben. Um, they had domesticated squash independently in the Eastern United States. Um, edible squash as well as gourds. Uh, they had also domesticated sunflowers um, and you start to see these at site. So, they start only maybe going to two or three sites in a year. So they're still a little bit nomadic, but if you're planting things, you have to be able to tend those gardens and keep an eye on them and protect them from uh, animal predators. So uh, you start to see bigger sites um, where people are living there for a longer period of time or coming back over and over to the same place. We also start to see uh, burials in and around these habitation sites. Uh, paleo and earlier archaic burials are very rare indeed, uh, but you start to see many more of these in the late archaic. All right. So the next time period, and, and archaeologists are funny, we like to put these big uh, time periods, you know, like the woodland period starts at 1000 BC, um, as if the, um, native tribes are saying, oh, well, okay, we have to be woodland now. But the, the transition obviously is gradual, but the woodland transition is marked by the appearance of pottery, which uh, was not present before, where people were actually gathering clay and making their own pottery. Um, and, and a few other things, an increase in, in agriculture. And we're gonna talk about a few of these here real quick, I'm trying to keep an eye on my time. Um, So woodland, we have early, middle, and late. So we have bright blue, pale blue, and purple. And if you look, we have um, pretty much concentrated up here near the entrance to the park. We have all three time periods. Um, we have uh, late woodland over here, and we have early woodland. There's a, actually an Indian mound over in this part of the park. Uh, and we have all the time periods down here. Uh, in the southern area as well. So they're pretty much spread out. And we talk about Fort Ancient, the later time period, we're gonna come back to the entrance because there are actually village sites up here at the entrance to the park. So that gives you an idea. We're kind of, they're kind of making use of the whole valley uh, resources. Um, these brown areas, there are sites, like see my arrow, there are archeological sites here. There are Indian artifacts here near the visitor center, there are Indian artifacts over here, but we didn't get any spear points or pottery, so we can't put them to a time period. But we know they're using the entire uh, terraces and, and river valley of the park. This is a big old map we're not gonna spend a lot of time on. We're up here. Um, let's see, there's, come on arrow, we're over here, right there. So Adena are the triangles, that's early woodland. We'll come back to that, see all the little triangles. We've got um, Ohio Hopewell, they're all kind of mixed together in the middle woodland time period. Um, and then up and down the Mississippi River Valley and across the Southeast. Right. So early woodland in Adena, um, there's a, a real shift around 300 BC, give or take. Um, we don't know exactly where these people were living. They weren't living in big villages. They're obviously living in small, uh, isolated households, or um, we call them hamlets, where maybe uh, extended families would live together. And at different times of the year, they would gather together and they would build 
huge mounds, some of them. Some of them are small, but a lot of them are quite large. Um, we get new types of projectile points. We get pottery, uh, like as I said, showing up for the first time. Um, there was a, a definite center for this culture in Boone County. Uh, it's very poorly understood at this point because we have so few habitation sites, but there are at least 30 mounds in Boone County that dates this time period. Um, it's very, very different from the ubiquitous late archaic sites. I mean, you, any field you walk around on the Ohio River Valley, um, Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, you're gonna find late archaic spear points uh, and, and habitation sites. Early woodland, um, they must have been living on the surface because they weren't leaving a lot underneath. For us to find. Uh, these are two uh, mounds from Boone County. Uh, the WPA uh, in the early late 1930s, early 1940s, um, before all the men got drafted for World War II, uh, were giving men work by doing archaeology. And the Robbins Mound, these are wonderful winter pictures of their excavation of the Robbins Mound. And uh, Krigler Mound, uh, this is what was underneath was a, uh, a building. These are uh, post holes from where posts were. And here's a profile of the Krigler Mound. Um, they excavated several of these in Boone County during that time frame. Poorly understood time period um, because it's all based on ceremonial uh, stuff. But a lot of a lot of points found. Middle Woodland and Hopewell. We really don't have a lot of evidence in northern Kentucky. Um, as I said, there's uh, one site at Big Bone that has produced. Uh, bladelets, uh, which are these uh, long skinny uh, chert or flint tools uh, that have been found at Big Bone. Um, we just found one last year in Kenton County, um, and there are only about five in Boone County that have uh, these artifacts. Uh, most of the Hope Hopewell regionally is in Ohio. They, and if you've ever been to Fort Ancient um, up near Lebanon, uh, that is from this time period. Um, all the earthworks over in Chillicothe and up in Newark uh, are all from this uh, Hopewell time period. And Hopewell ended about 500 AD, so about a zero to 500, and then it disappeared within several generations. And uh, within several generations, people switched from making all um, these bladelets or these fancy mica uh, cutouts and uh, copper tools, and here's a quartz hand, um, to, uh, oh, forgot, here are hilltop enclosures. So we have images of these. If you have ever not been to Fort Ancient, need to get there, uh, get a good look at it. Um, here's the actual Hopewell site, uh, which is over near uh, Chillicothe. All right, so about 500 AD, 400 to 500, something happened um, in the Ohio Valley to Hopewell. We don't know what it is. Um, but they went from living in small communities, building these very large earthworks, to not doing that. Uh, they stopped making bladelets. They stopped making the fancy pottery. Um, they stopped building the earthworks. And they switched to actually living in villages at this time. Uh, the Roger site that I wrote my master's thesis on in Boone County is from this time period. Uh, they were focusing more on their local community. Uh, they were still burying people in, in small mounds, um, but they weren't building a large earthworks anymore. Uh, no more long distance trade, at least for a couple of hundred years. And toward the end of this time period, about 900 AD, give or take, and our knowledge of the time periods get better, of course, the, the further we go in time and the more trash they leave behind for us to analyze, corn or maize shows up in the Ohio Valley and also the bow and arrow, um, which made hunting a little bit more efficient than it had been. Um, maize agriculture is, is what is gonna define the next time period, the Fort Ancient time period for us in the Ohio Valley. And, um, oops, I gotta turn off my, I had my alarm set so I wouldn't forget to um, stop talking. I'm gonna turn that off, all right. So corn shows up in this area, 
and with corn comes full planned organized villages. And around here, we call this the Fort Ancient Time Period. And it's in pale green, pale green, green, pale green, pale green. It is throughout the entire park. Um, and the big fields, like where they have the salt festival, that is on a Fort Ancient village. So there's a Fort Ancient village here. There's a Fort Ancient village over here. Uh, these are not as big down here, but there are Fort Ancient uh, components pretty much throughout the park. And I'm gonna point out the one um, historic time period is uh, here, a little box all by itself. And we're gonna to get to that in about a minute. All right, I'm almost done, Tara. So the Fort Ancient time period, uh, maize agriculture settled planned villages. So they weren't, it just wasn't like one family and then another family would move in. They would literally build the entire village at the same time. Everybody built their houses at the same time. Many of them had walls or palisades around them, uh, whether for protection or uh, cultural identity. Uh, we're really not quite sure. Not a lot of evidence for, for warfare, at least early in this time period. Uh, bow and arrow, little triangle points are um, actual true arrow points. You start seeing hoes, these uh, shells with the ho holes in them, or these are actual hoes uh, used to for planting. And about every 20 years, as they strip the nutrients from the soil, because maize will do that if you don't rotate your crops, they would literally pick up the entire village and move five, 10, however many miles up or down their stream valley and build an entire new village. And so these villages move up and down. Um, they hunt, they still hunted and collected wild plants. Uh, they did have the advantage of bows and arrows. And here's some more arrow points. Uh, they built, uh, made uh, wonderful pottery. Uh, they began tempering it with shell, with mussel shells uh, during this time period. In the Ohio Valley, this culture lasts up to the 1600s. So it lasts up into the historic time period. Some examples of Sunwatch Village um, up near Dayton, Ohio. If you haven't been there, you should look this one up too, Sunwatch Village. It is a recreated uh, 13th century uh, Indian village. It was a wonderful museum. They are, these sites are found on all the major streams in Boone, Kenton, and Campbell counties. And of course, as I said, pretty much all over Big Bend. Uh, there's another site in Campbell County called the Bent Site. Um, this is a slightly different layout. Uh, the rectangles are houses and the brown ovals are burials. So they essentially had a street with burials at either end. So a little bit different layout than the circular arrangement at Sunwatch. Um, Petersburg is built on a Fort Ancient Village. Um, and this is a site called the Cleek McCabe site, which I'm not going to tell you where it is, but if you, can you see the dark? Tara, can you see it on your slide where my, my arrows are? So these are, yeah. Wait, yes, the, really okay, doing. those are the shadows of village sites. The Fort Ancient people essentially threw their trash where they lived. And so all that organic material would uh, mix with the dirt and would actually stain the soil. And so uh, depending on the aerial photographs, you can see them from, from old aerial photos. This is an example of a house. All right, so historic time periods at Big Ben, obviously we have a lot of information about uh, historic tribes. Um, uh, the Iroquois Confederacy drove out most of the native tribes from Ohio, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, uh, Western Pennsylvania uh, because of the fur trade. And so th that creates a disconnect between that and the disease uh, smallpox brought into the Southeast by the Spanish caused a big disconnect between prehistoric archeological sites in the Ohio Valley and the tribes who made their way back in the 1700s. One famous person we don't have time to talk about, maybe somebody else could do a talk sometime on Mary Draper Ingalls, uh, who was taken captive and brought to Big Ben, escaped from there and walked all the way back to her home in West Virginia. Um, 
1755, but she is proof uh, that the Shawnee, the Native Americans were still using big bone for salt production. And um, one really interesting site uh, in um, 2008, they found a bison kill site in big bone. Everybody got all excited because they were hoping it would be paleo, but it turned out to be historic time period. Um, so probably a Shawnee or, or Cherokee or some other tribe um, that was hunting bison, which had returned to this area, which is, is fascinating. So very interesting. Here's some pictures of the bison uh, as they uncovered them and they found tools. They found sharpened flint um, that the Indians had used to butcher the bison. So it, it's really, very interesting. I think Tara, we are pretty much at the end. Um, that was our whirlwind tour. We, we could do one night on every single time period, but. Yes, we could, and that was wonderful. Well, I, do, I do have so many questions. I personally. Well, I'm have sure. <laughs> and, um, and the audience had some questions, Janine. I'm gonna go in, um, I'm gonna just start at the beginning when everyone submitted their questions. So we will just get to as many as we can. Okay. Um, do you wanna go ahead though and and tell us the, the, sure. the quiz? Is that okay? Do you mind? Yep, there it is. William, William, William Clark, and they are at the Cincinnati Museum Center. Okay. So I, so I have Lewis and Clark at Monticello. Nope. Nope. Well, I mean, it was William Clark, but right. they've right. never been at Monticello. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Well, I. Um, I mean, I mean they, they, excuse me, they went through to the early Western Museum, the first museum. Uh, they stayed in Cincinnati. They were given, I think, probably to, to Dr. Goforth or one of those guys. And um, then they were given to when they started the first museum. And then eventually in the later 19th century, they ended up at the Cincinnati Art Museum. And mm -hmm. they, they gave them to the Cincinnati Museum Center. Great. I think okay. about 20 years ago. So, all right. Well, I do not see that answer in our list here. So I'm going to say that you stumped the group this time. So Woody, Woody, you should have known that. Cindy, I see you. <laughs> um, okay, so first question. Okay. Um, can you elaborate a bit on Clovis in terms of, do you see it as a time period or, or more of a people? Um, and is there, can you, can you talk about what does that word really mean in terms of where it comes from? Okay, uh, a lot in there. One, uh, they are called Clovis points because in the earlier 20th century, they were first described or defined at a place called Clovis, New Mexico. Okay. So they're just named for the place that uh, an archeologist first described them. A, a lot of these, a lot of the different projectile points are named for where they were first found. Okay. That's why I said they should be called big bone points, but you know, th those points got lost for a, a century or more. So um, I think Clovis is a technology. Mm -hmm. And my personal opinion is that people were already here. That's why I brought this map up. My first, my opinion is that people were already here. Somebody invented the Clovis point and said, and, and there's there's distinctive technological things about it we don't have time to talk about but i think somebody invented it and said wow this will kill a lot of mastodons or mammoth or giant bison and then taught somebody else how to make it they taught somebody else how to make it and they were moving around their landscape we have flint raw material that these people were carrying for hundreds of miles so they would, they found good flint sources and, and you find those hundreds of miles away. And so they're moving around the landscape. And when you have a technology that works, I think it just spread very, very quickly. And I think the problem is when there were no more big animals to kill, you didn't need that technology anymore. Sure. So I think the culture is already there, whatever it was. 
uh, and, and I just, I just think it's a technology. That's my personal opinion. Um, you know, everybody's got different ones. I hope that helped the audience. I felt it so. be very, very helpful. So speaking of weapons for a second, mm -hmm. um, and please forgive my pronunciation. Um, how does the atl atl work? It's and actually at ladle. At ladle. Okay. And what motion is used um, mm -hmm. in order to use that? I don't think I can demonstrate that on a Zoom, but <laughs> okay. I I have a picture of an atlas. Right there. there it is. All right. Um, you see the the spear shaft with the feathers on it, right? It's mm -hmm. up here at the top, and then the person's holding it with their hand, and they have a counterweight back here at the back and a little hook. So your spear has to have a hole in it. And these these were generally two parts. So there's usually a, a, a shaft and then a, a smaller dart that would like keep going at the front. So um, it's like a lever hmm. and it's an extension of your hand. So when you pick it up and throw it, it propels it forward. And um, you should go to the salt festival if they have it this year, but you know, if you've been there or next year, they usually have people demonstrating how to throw these. Interesting. Uh, at, at Big Bone at, at various events. Woody, shake your head. Yes, I'm right. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. What? They're, they're a very, very efficient tool. So you've mentioned a lot of these, you know, spear points and so forth. Is there evidence of the Native Americans in this area eating mussels or hunting for fish? Uh, yes to both. Great. Um, it, it shifts with the time periods. Um, Earlier time periods, because they're moving around so much, you don't get so many of them piled in one place that you can find them. Mm -hmm. uh, down in the Green River Valley in Western Kentucky, when I said about Middle Archaic, there are shell middens, piles of mussel shells, um, uh, you know, probably 15, 20 feet high, you know, multiple tens of feet long, where they were harvesting them. Uh, around here, when you get up into the Fort Ancient time period, um, their sites are full of mussel shells because they're all mostly next to the rivers. Sure. So they were using them in their pottery. They were eating them. You find like roast pits of them where they roasted them. So yes. Great, thank you. Um, I think you talked about this just a bit, but how many mounds remain in Boone County? Um, I guess that I guess I'm going to say the question implies maybe um, you know untouched or at least somewhat still there. Well, that thirty includes the ones that were excavated in the by the WPA, which I think they might have done five or six. Okay. So in several probably got plowed away, maybe um, or ones we never even knew about that got bulldozed. Um, but there's probably at least 20 okay. that, that are still there. And, and the interesting thing, just as a side note, in Kenton County, I think there are two. And, Cam and Campbell County has maybe two. So there's something very different going on in Boone County yeah. culturally than, than Kenton or Campbell. Right. That's well, fascinating. Um, so speaking of Campbell County, are you able to say where in Campbell County is the Blintz site? The Blintz site, I'd rather not. But. Okay, I had a feeling about that. <laughs> that was one of the questions, so I wanted to ask, but I, I had to. I know, I know. It, we, we try not to say exactly where things yeah. are. Yeah. It's on right. private property anyway. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit when we were talking about the batteries. So I, yes. I, I remember that. Um, okay, so going out of the region just a, a bit when when you mentioned the mounds destroyed in the Columbus Ohio area um, were all of those Adena or Hopewell I hope I'm emphasizing the right part of that question but I don't remember talking about mounds being destroyed. oh maybe you didn't talk about it but the question was there were hundreds of mounds destroyed in the Columbus Ohio area all the hundreds of mounds destroyed in Columbus, Ohio, and elsewhere were Adena or Hopewell questions. Oh, okay. All right. Um, 
Yeah, I'm sure that there were also in the Chillicothe area, um, downtown Cincinnati, uh, had multiple earthworks, both. Um, the ones that were in downtown Cincinnati, based on historical information, they were probably Adina and Hopewell. Adina and Hopewell overlap. Nobody's really quite sure if Adina turns into Hopewell or if it's kind of like Catholic and Protestant. Do you know what I mean? Where you have different versions of something. Um, Hopewell's a little bit later than Adina, uh, but there is an overlap in time period. Great. Um, of them. So I, but there are both. Um, yes, both. So I have one other question. I, I everybody in the audience, I, I hope I got to all the questions. I'm pretty sure that I did um, or that they were covered. Um, I did want to get to one other question for, for me, and I think this would be good for everyone. If we wanted to find out more, you mentioned a number of great sites to visit. But are there any books or other resources that you would recommend, um, maybe if we can't go right now for, for any number of reasons, um, where we can sure. Oh, let's see. There's a book called Kentucky Archaeology okay. um, that you can buy um, various booklets at the library that UK has put out. Um, I've got the Northern Kentucky Encyclopedia has a couple of articles. I've got one on the whole chronology. I think there's a separate one in there on Fort Ancient um, time period. Um, about this area in general, most of what I wrote is in the encyclopedia. So it's, it's all in there. Uh, obviously, academic, lots of academic stuff. Sure. Very, very helpful. Um, well, once again, we um, are out of time. Thank you to those of you that stuck with us. Apologize again for our technical difficulties at the beginning. This is what we get for trying something new. So um, before we go, I did want to let you all know about a couple of things. First of all, next week, uh, we will be joined by Mark Ramler. He is the co-founder of Mansion Hill Properties. And he has done um, quite a bit of research about Camp Springs in Campbell County. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, Camp Springs was settled in the mid 19th century by German immigrants. And they used the stone uh, in that area to build their churches, uh, homes, and, uh, and they, they also had vineyards. So it's a very unique looking area, very distinct in Northern Kentucky. So Mark is gonna share the history and some of the architecture of Camp Springs. So I hope you will join us for that. Um, also, just as a reminder, if you have missed any of our past Northern Kentucky History Hour programs, or if you'd like to learn more about some of these topics, Curator of Collections, Jason French, has been doing some excellent shorter programming called the Curator's Chats. Those are all available via our Facebook page and also our YouTube page. And so really encourage you to check those out. Jason does a great job about bringing up certain places or artifacts and really um, within a five minute period, getting in depth about a singular thing. It's they're really entertaining. So encourage you to, to check those out. And then again, um, if you want to learn more about anything related to the museum, including our opening hours, go to bcmuseum.org. I hope everyone has a great night and until next week, take care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Janine. Good night. Good night. Good night.